Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I you to worship this morning at Harvard Avenue Christian Church. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we pray that wherever you are, the light is going to shine into your light and into your heart this morning as we gather to give worship and praise to our God who is filled with limitless love for all of you and for all our world. Today as we do gather, we are grateful you are here with us, and we hope that you'll take time to fill out the connection card that is on the link with this email or with this podcast today. Also, please take time to fill it out to let us know that you are here, to let us know a little bit about you. Make note of also the links uh, to Worship and Wonder for our children, so our children and their families also can stay connected. There's also a link there for you to be able to give to support the church and the ministry that you love here at Harvard Avenue Christian Church. Finally, there's a resource that we made available to you this last week. It complements our sermon series, A New Heart for a New Year. We interviewed five leaders, Christian leaders from around the country on each of the petitions in this prayer. We hope that you will go to the website and make use of it for your small group or personally. It comes with a beautiful, beautiful study guide. We hope you will enjoy it as much as we have. Now may the grace and love of God fill your hearts and minds today in this hour of worship. All praise and glory and honor be to God, the creator and redeemer of us all. In your worship email today, you received prayer concerns from our congregation, people that we appreciate you holding in your prayers this week. You might remember too that your church directory can be a partner in your prayers, Just open it at random and find someone to pray for or to write to or look up the name of that person that you haven't seen in quite a while and send them a note or give them a call this week and just let them know that they're on your heart and mind. Praying for one another and with each other is a great gift in the life of this community. We come today with prayers for so many in our congregation, in our nation, and in our world. So as we come to a time for our pastoral prayer today, I would invite you to join me in a simple moment of silence, and then I will pray for us together. Let us pray. creative and wonderful God, we come to you from wherever we are, wherever you have had us this week, we know that we have been in your presence. Wherever you have moved us in the world, we know that you have been with us every step of the way. Wherever you have created anew from chaos, we know that you are there. Wherever you have drawn us into concern, into compassion, or into celebration, we know that it is your creative energy that inspires us and moves us in the world. 
You came to us as one of us, Jesus the Christ, in human form so that we would know what it means to be in relationship with you, what it means to be compassionate and merciful, what it means to be welcoming and inclusive, what it looks like to move with care and thoughtfulness through our days. It is because of our teacher, our rabbi, our friend, our savior, Jesus Christ, it is because of him that we know who you are. And it is in the face of one another that we see his face reflecting back. Holy Spirit, you moved over the deep in the beginning over all that was and made all that is. You sustain us still with your breath and your wisdom. Breathe into us now that we might be filled with your wisdom to guide us, that we might not rely on our own understanding, but we might look to you when we are lost, when we are afraid, when we are concerned, when we are torn. God, as we look to our nation this week, and as we see the days that have come before, we come with concern in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of death, in the midst of violence, in the midst of disease. We come to you, and you tell us to keep moving forward, to look ahead, to look to you, to look inside, for you have already given us every good gift, all that we can need to make this world the garden you intended it to be. Empower us and strengthen us. Embolden us for the days to come. May we be wise and kind and generous and thoughtful and careful May we take all that you have offered and may it be filled with a fresh wind of your spirit moving us through each day. We come to you, Lord, to pray because we know we can. Out of our silence and in our celebration, you are with us. Help us to keep in mind that even in the midst of all that shakes us to our core, your wonders are still at work. Babies are still being born. Children are still learning to walk. Students are still learning to read. Adults are still discovering new gifts in themselves. Bind us up in your wisdom and in your grace that we might see challenge and move toward it with your gifts, that we might note celebrations and do all we can to draw that circle wider. Guide us and direct us. Inspire us with your grace. We pray in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our word of Scripture for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 21 through 29. Hear now these sacred words. Not everyone who asks me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Here ends the reading of this sacred and unsettling text. You know, there's no need to sugarcoat what Jesus proclaims here in this passage. There are going to be some who are so sure they're in, only to discover that they're in for a surprise. Oh, sadly enough, I confess when I read a text like this, my first instinct is to conveniently write myself out of it as if Jesus' warning was intended for all those people that I think need to be set straight. It's just too easy when we encounter a passage like this to immediately think of someone else that we should screenshot it, post it to their Facebook page with the hashtag, you got another thing coming. And I can only imagine that is why only a few verses earlier, Jesus reminds us that we must first wipe the dirt off our own face before considering ourselves fit to clean up someone else's act. You know, whether we want to hear it or not, Jesus is always inviting us to point our finger back towards ourselves and do our own transformational work as a people of faith. So today, as we continue on in our series, A New Heart for a New Year, I invite you to consider with me the inner work of cultivating wisdom. You know, for all the roles that are so important that Jesus plays in our lives, He is also the embodiment of divine wisdom for us. A divine wisdom that the book of Proverbs tells us was created at the beginning of the Lord's work. His first of acts long ago and was daily his delight. And perhaps that imagery from the Hebrew scriptures brings to mind the first verses of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. You see, Jesus was not only well-versed in the sacred wisdom teachings of the Jewish community, but those sacred teachings were incorporated into his life. His teachings came from the very core of who he was. His life was his message. And in this sense, it's no surprise that his audiences were amazed by the authority with which he spoke. Jesus tells us something about the importance of this in our scripture today. He says it's not good enough just to say the right words or know the right doctrines or quote the right scriptures. It's not about your inflection or the volume of your voice or how incendiary and provocative your words are. You can do all the right things and wave a Jesus flag, but Jesus demonstrates that our message only has real authority when it comes from the very core of who we are, and only insofar as the teachings of Christ have become integrated into our very being. And that is the work that he asks of those who call themselves his disciples, to embody divine wisdom and bring it to life by shaping new hearts that are more Christ-like. 
Jesus demand that we disciples be on our A-game to learn His ways towards conversion of our whole selves and ultimately to have our lives transformed by the renewing of our minds, as the Apostle Paul put it. I want to paraphrase part of our scripture passage this morning using Eugene Peterson's translation, the message, because I think it really cuts to the heart of the matter. Jesus says there, these words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life or homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. And if you work towards including them and incorporating them in your life, you are like a wise carpenter who builds his house on solid rock. So let's wise up here. As disciples of Christ, how shall we make good on becoming the wise people God has called us to be? I'm not going to sell you a simple answer here, but I'll offer some thoughts to keep in mind for the work ahead, drawing upon Jesus' metaphor of building a house on a solid foundation. And the first, as any good builder should do, follow your blueprints. You know, if we're committed to solid instruction, a, a meaningful blueprint for seeking divine wisdom, then it's likely that our efforts will yield something sturdy. Knowing then, where to look for good blueprints is the key in this otherwise messy world. Look to things that are enduring. Look to Christ and His teachings. Consider His ways. Those that moved people from egocentricity to love and compassion, from a judgmental and dualistic either-or worldview into an expansive and abundant way of seeing the divine connection in all things, even within ourselves. And look to wise people around you. You'll find them because Jesus tells us that the truly godly and wise, you'll know because of the fruit they bear in their living. He also warns us in the seventh chapter of Matthew that if you will see someone who seems to attract trouble, chances are you've stumbled across a false prophet. Grapes, he says, aren't gathered from thorns, nor figs from thistles. So pay attention to the fruit that those around you you call teachers and leaders are bearing, and seek your counsel from those that bear good fruit. Work to find the best, most meaningful blueprints for this undertaking. Then roll up your sleeves. Because becoming wise doesn't just happen by itself, at least not in the spiritual sense. I know often people think that wisdom comes over time with age, but I tell you that sometimes age just comes by itself. Growing in Jesus' way of wisdom is an active pursuit. It's to embark on an inner path of growth and development whose gate is narrow and less often trod, as Jesus suggests. No one else can make you wise. Sure, things will happen to you. Others can offer counsel, teach by example, and be a critical encouragement to you. But the only one who can do the work necessary is yourself. This construction project is yours to do. Now, several summers ago, during a hurricane season in Florida, there was a storm that had a devastating effect on a particular housing addition. Blocks and blocks of houses were completely destroyed. But the, curiously enough, one house in the middle of the subdivision was left standing. It was perplexing because all the other houses were about the same age and style. And so curious about this unexplained phenomenon, of course, the media interviewed the homeowner. And you know what he said? I built this house myself. I made sure I built it as the state building codes required. I did everything the way they said to do it. When they said to use a two-by-six ceiling joist, that's what I did. Because they said if I built to code, it would withstand a hurricane. Turns out they were right. Now this homeowner had done the tedious work from the ground up of developing this structure, so he at least knew it was built to code. But just think of all the people who bought a house in that neighborhood, assuming that it too had been built to code. And how often, 
we have moved into houses of cultural convenience and worldly wisdom that we assume are secure only to find out that we've been sold a house of cards. Roll up your sleeves, friends, because no one else can be responsible to make your life more Christ-like. And be ready to clock in every day on this one. The act of building a life that embodies the wisdom of Christ is not a summer-long event or even a 20-year one. This is a lifelong undertaking that requires our energy, attention, focus each and every day. I'll be the first to admit that that commitment level is not what I'm always ready to put in. And I think of all the other things that I want to pursue, the DIY projects I've got on my list, the entertaining distractions of 24-hour news cycles and top tips for keeping your hair shiny. And you know, we humans are so inclined to deceive ourselves and others and thinking that maybe we can just sideline our spiritual disciplines until the storms of life hit and we find ourselves experiencing the consequence of our lack of action and the consequences of other people's choices not to do their work. We must clock in every day to ensure the development and integrity of the dwelling place that we are building for Christ. I encourage you this week to think about what practices you will take on each day to move the meter on this project, to throw a wrench in maybe habits that are seemingly mindless that you want to shake, to do your work on Scripture, to do your prayers, put in the work, clock in. And expect weather to factor in. Notice that Jesus didn't say in our Scripture passage that those who built their lives on a solid foundation would avoid all storms. Look, the tempests of this world don't discriminate between wise and foolish, pious and wicked. It simply says that the house which they built would endure those storms. Now let's face it. A pandemic, political unrest, economic distress, the weather, friends, has been rough for some time now. And right now, we're all really just beginning to reckon with the ways that our bodies and minds and souls have been affected. And it's likely that we've discovered that there are parts of our foundation that have been compromised. Perhaps we've discovered that it was a bit sandy under us after all. We all know the pain and grief of having to lose some way of being that we've spent years developing and invested in. It's tempting even to hunker down and hide in comfortable modes of living and being in this world, even when we begin to see them for the sandy castles that they are, destined to be washed away by the tides of time. Friends, no, it is never too late to find a better blueprint, to roll up those sleeves, to clock in on building your life on a stronger footing of Christ. And time and time again, Jesus affirms that His wise ways are freely available to us. And He offers this assurance, ask, and it will be given to you. Search and you will find, knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives. And everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And finally, I want to say this. That your commitment to building a dwelling place to house the wisdom of Jesus means your house will bless this world. Now, sometimes we use the word sacrament in our churchy lingo. And sacrament refers to those practices which we do as a community like communion and baptism. Those things we say are visible forms of an invisible grace. But these sacraments literally draw divine truth into existence for us to partake of and share with the world. 
And so it is. That when you live in such a way that you are embodying the ways of Christ, you are drawing into existence His ways of divine wisdom. You're giving that sacred wisdom life through who you are becoming. And it's amazing the impact that even one person can have in this world that chooses to make their life a living sacrament. Everything around them is affected. You'll be a blessing everywhere you show up, in your relationships, at your workplace, and your ability to speak out of love and with authority about the injustices that exist in our communities. If you're willing to put in the work, your house will bless this world. So here's to wising up. To seeking out divine wisdom. Friends, look to Christ and other wise people for your blueprints. Roll up those sleeves, get ready to clock in. Let's commit ourselves this year to a new heart with wisdom. Something more beautiful and enduring. For the name and for the sake of Jesus the Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord and source of all wisdom, we give thanks for the ways that you train us towards the path of the wise. We ask this day, Lord of our hearts, that you would give us wisdom to guide our ways this day and always. Amen.
raise me up to more than I can be. At this table, we invite you all to share in a feast of the very heart of God. In the teaching, in the ministry, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see the heart of God. We see God's heart in that Christ was broken for us to give us new life and forgiveness. We lift up the cup remembering God's heart when Christ said, this is my new covenant, a new blood poured out for the many for the forgiveness of our sins. How is your heart today? How is your soul today? Because of the love and mercy of God and the reconciliation we have through Jesus Christ, we can come with confidence to his table to have our hearts renewed, our will and resolve strengthened by his love and grace. Come, let us pray. O God, who renews us and revives us, though we are blessed to be on this journey with you, there are times we confess when we get weary and our hearts fail us and they are weak. We make poor choices. We choose our own wisdom over yours. And we confess that when we do take our eyes off you and we let the cares and worries of this world invade our hearts and minds, they sometimes will drag us down and discourage us. Through this bread and cup, renew our hearts and minds and give us new wisdom and energy for the living of these days. In Christ's love we pray. Amen.
In your worship email today, you received prayer concerns from our congregation, people that we appreciate you holding in your prayers this week. You might remember, too, that your church director We're so glad that you've been part of worship with us today. We hope that you are finding this Celtic prayer a meaningful way to reflect and pray, not only when we're in worship together, but throughout the week. Today, we have studied the petition for wisdom to guide us. We have heard music, we have heard words from scripture, we have heard a sermon, perhaps in there somewhere, we have heard God. So listen for that voice this week. That small glimmer, that tiny whisper, even in the midst of all the noise, that reminds us of what is wise and what is good and what is our work to do in the world, to share that wisdom, to be guided by it. Not only when we're in worship together for these few minutes, but as we move through each day, each week, each month, each year of our lives, May we be more and more faithful, wiser, guided by the light of Christ. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.